I have a lot of different people that work in my team. We've got some research associates that look at the reflection of GPS waves off the surface of the earth and we're learning about sea level and snow depth and uh, soil moisture in that part of the group. I have someone else who's using satellite gravity to try and understand how the water cycle is changing globally. And then um, a few of us do GNSS, work with GNSS data to look at how the earth, the surface of the earth moves up and down, in particular under Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a hot spot. What that means is that at the, the core mantle boundary deep inside the earth, every now and again a big blob of, of um, magma comes up and expresses itself at the surface. So since we've been taking observations in Yellowstone, and these observations go back to the 1920s, there's evidence that the caldera itself breathes. So it goes up for a few years, and then it subsides for a few years. It goes up, and it subsides. And what's um, confusing, what people don't understand, is whether that uh, uplift subsidence cycle is related to magma itself coming close to the surface and then spreading out, or whether it's related to the heating of water in a layer right below the surface of the Earth. So we're one of the few teams in the world that do absolute gravity observations. And these are very, very precise observations of gravity. If you remember from elementary physics, Newton's law of gravitation is that it, it's related to distance from the center of the Earth, but it's also related to the mass under an instrument. So as the Earth goes up, uh, our gravity meter moves away from the center of the Earth and gravity goes down. But if a mass moves in and it displaces the rock, so the rock has a gravity of a certain value, ma if water moves in, it's less than the value, the density of that rock, so the gravity would go down. If it's magma, it's probably higher than the density of that rock and it'll go up. So by combining the measurements of the ground going up and down with the measurements of gravity, we're going to be able to tell uh, whether it's due to magma moving into the area or whether it's due to water inflating and moving around. Remote sensing itself is measuring some pr parameters associated with the Earth at the Earth's surface, but you're using space to either send a signal down and receive a signal, or in our case, the GPS uh, satellites send a signal and they're received by GPS receivers that are on the ground. And as the electric properties of the top layer of the surface changes, um, the reflections will also change. And so by looking at how those reflections change with time, we can look at things like soil moisture. And soil moisture is really, really important for the global water cycle, and it's also important for predicting flooding in certain places. So we've concentrated a lot on Europe. We've concentrated a little bit on Yellowstone. We're concentrating in Antarctica. We're looking at the snow and how the snow properties are changing with time. And then up in the Arctic Circle, we're using reflections off of the water to learn about Arctic tides, because we don't have a lot of observations of the tides in the Arctic. And this is just just uh, an observation of opportunity. We have the instruments there to measure the ground going up and down, but we're not using them for that in this situation. We're using them to me measure the reflections off the water surface and to get the tides better. Climate change is really important, and it's part of what motivated the EU's program, Copernicus program. It's a set of uh, five missions with a bunch of supporting missions that will tell us about the state of the Earth um, as long as those satellites are up. And the state of the Earth means that we'll be able to observe change over a, a certain amount of time as well. So it gives us a global picture of what's happening, land, surface, oceans, the water uh, in lakes and rivers, um, the atmosphere. It's a fantastic data set.